Um, all right, so before I begin, just a quick, uh, you know, disclaimer. Even though I'm part of comms and I'm doing comms and I'm trying to do strategy in comms, you know, nobody is really a 100% expert in this. So what I'll be doing is I'll try to share some of the insights and some of the systems and processes we're going to be able to put in place in my team. And I'll share with you some examples of the campaigns that we've done. Um, but essentially, I think comms is it's a very personal thing. You know, it's a thing that has to do with your brand, with your company, with your culture. And um, the more you work in a team or an organization, the more you get to know them, the more you start to identify with the voice and the tone and with the, all, your audience. So for everyone, things might be slightly different, but hopefully um, I've, you know, I'll, I'll bring you a little bit of our sort of high level of structure and system that we put in place. Um, and the other, so I'll, I'll start with just a little bit about uh, myself. Um, my role is a little bit untraditional, I guess. Not tons of people have the luck in a way and the luxury to do what I do uh, because in my team, I already have a couple of our comms officers. We have a videographer, a designer, um, and we have a public engagement officer. So I started in the team as a comms officer. And then I slowly carved my role where I kind of started doing more web work, more strategy for social media. I started looking more at analytics and I've had the luxury of actually stepping back a little bit and starting to think more about why we're doing things, how we're doing them. Um, and I often you know, get to work on optimizing how we do things and testing new things, you know. Um, this is something that, you know, it's very hard to carve time for. So obviously for small teams or people who do comms on the side, this may not be something you can start doing right away, but um, hopefully sort of the little system that I've put together and how we approach campaigns may help you get started. Um, one of the things to know about me is that I actually don't have a background in science at all. <laughs> I have a background in journalism and, uh, you know, marketing and advertising. I worked for Harvard Medical School. I worked for, for a software company that did uh, clinical research software. I worked in an advertising agency for some time. So moving to Amber BI meant actually uh, you know, moving into science and approaching something completely new. And, you know, part of me is happy about that because I get to approach comms with an outsider's perspective. You know, I get to really always have this fresh look about how things get seen because science is a little bit, sometimes I feel a little bit behind and how it's being approached on, on social media and other channels, you know. Uh, on the other hand, there's a huge opportunity to actually tap into this new audience and tons of more people who are willing to use social media on, on various channels. Uh, on the other hand, I don't always understand everything that I have to communicate about. And that means actually having lots of conversations with people in the Institute, getting buying people lots of coffee and cake and asking them to explain to me genomics and different other things. So, um, I do learn a lot on the job, and I think you know nobody's a hundred percent you know prepared to move into a job into a new field. But you always have to ask questions and have the right connections. You know, one of the things that I found very helpful is having my go-to people, my go-to experts for various fields. So whenever we have a campaign coming up about something, I know that my go-to colleague from that particular team can explain things or help me figure this out. Um, one superpower that I do have that I'm very proud about is my team. My team is brilliant. Um, you know, it's it's you you can conceptualize various sort of campaigns and ideas, but it it comes down in the end to the execution. So having very good allies and people that you work with, um, and that means also times collaborators, comms officers at other organizations partner organizations like Elixir, like my friends here in Manchenia, this is very, very valuable because when you're trying to put something together, um, actually collaborating and working with other teams and finding resources that you may not have is crucial because sometimes you may find that one of your partners, you know, they have a comms team or they have somebody on the team who can help you you know, with a visual for your campaign, or somebody can really vet some of the copy that you're putting together. So, um, you know, nurturing those relationships is, is very important. In my team in particular, 
we're very lucky because um, I do have the content that gets created in my team is pitched to me. So it's written by other people. Sometimes people in different teams, it gets pitched to me and then I get to shape it, give it sort of one voice, one tone, and then we package it into what becomes a campaign. Um, I guess some of you may be curious to understand, you know, to, to figure out like what, what makes for a successful campaign. And I think different people will see this very differently. Some people look at clicks, some people look at how polished it looks, you know, how well it presents your organization or team. I, I'm one of those devil's advocates. I'm always siding with the users and the audience. So I think it's somewhere in the middle. So there's all this messaging that we want our audience to know, you know, there's pressure that we want them to know this about us. We want them to know for sure that we do this. And then there's the stuff that our audience uh, is interested to hear. And that's something that's very difficult to swallow sometimes because they may not be always interested to hear what you have to say. So the ideal campaign would be somewhere in the middle where you're able to deliver your message in a way that would be interesting and engaging for your audience, something that they would find useful, applicable. And that's not always easy, especially when we have sometimes, uh, you know, there's certain things that have to do with more PR probably than what we actually, you know, what's useful to our audience. So managing that, managing that expectation is very tricky. Um, and, you know, we found in the long run, and BI has tons of databases and resources and tools. And we have, we found that on social media, most of the people who follow us are actually users. They don't always care about, you know, the big brand or the, you know, the how many identities of each resources we have. All they care is that they want to do their work and they want to do it quickly and they want to do it efficiently. And they don't really care about sometimes all the collaborations and stuff like that. So, you know, we have to balance this thing because we want to obviously show that we're working with tons of organizations who are doing tons of excellent work. And on the other hand, all we want people to do is to use the resource. So sometimes you do have to make that choice as to what is the most important thing you're trying to communicate. What is the ultimate goal? And sometimes that means accepting something at the price of your own PR. And that's okay. Um, one of the things also that you may encounter, especially when you're getting started, you're getting requests for a campaign. And um, it's one of those things where people come through the door and say, we have to have a campaign. It has to be about this. It has to be fabulous. Do it now. And you are, um, you know, we're all very tempted to say yes, especially when you're just getting started and you're being told that comms is a little bit part of your role. You feel like you have no role, you know, no right to say no. But that's not always true. I think every time you get a request for a campaign or an idea for a campaign, it's very important to think, just step, take a step back and think about the purpose. And one of the things that we found is that actually thinking about how a campaign, you know, fulfills a strategic objective of our organization is one of the basic questions you have to start with. You know, some campaigns are nice to have. They look good on paper, but when you actually do it, it doesn't really add tons of value. And yet you're putting so much time and effort and resources, you're pulling people's time together for this. So, you know, identifying and knowing first your organization's strategic objectives, what are you trying to do? You know, for example, for Emily VI, one of the things we're trying to do is advocate for open data. We want to get more people who use our freely available open data resources, you know, um, we're trying to, you know, train people in bioinformatics and we're trying to do tons of knowledge transfer and knowledge exchange. So if, if the campaigns that we do are serving those purposes, then we're fine. You know, we, we're, we're willing to put the resources and time into it. So it's definitely something to kind of ask your leadership, uh, what are your strategic objectives and start from there. How, do, how is your campaign aligned with that? The other thing is reach, you know, you have to really do a, have an honest conversation with your team and your leadership as to what audience, you know, what channels you have access to. Sometimes everyone, some, somebody may come over and say, oh, we want to do this video. 
um, this one brilliant interview, but then you don't necessarily have a place for this video to live on. So if you don't have a page that this video would live on, it will have a very short shelf life, you know? So you have to think of all these bits and make sure they're in place before you kind of embark on actually putting the campaign together. The other thing would be um, quality. And quality is something that, um, you know, it's long-term, it has a long-term impact. You can, if you start uh, putting together good, high quality campaigns, your followers and users will, will notice that, you know, they'll, they'll keep an eye on these things. They'll have this association that, oh, the stuff that comes from this organization, um, it's, you know, it's worth my time. Um, let, let me check it out. Um, and the other thing is impact. Um, it's very good to actually set some measurable goals. And it's very tricky in the beginning because you don't have a sense of what you're comparing uh, these goals to, right? So if you're setting the goal to have, let's say, 100 clicks to, to, to your link, for example, or you want people to watch your video for at least 30 seconds, um, or how many views do you aim for? In the beginning, it's, it's a little bit like setting these goals in the dark. But the more you do it, um, the better you get a sense of what is a baseline, what is an average for your organization, for your particular channel or your account. And once you get a sense of that, it's a lot easier to set a goal for the following campaign. Um, so, you know, even though in the beginning it's kind of a, kind of a strange exercise and you're not sure where it's going, I would highly encourage you to try and do it. Um, and sometimes you may be wrong. So even if you're wrong in the beginning or you're just setting your goals, that's totally fine because you'll learn from it and you iterate on it. And the next time you'll, you know, set those goals in a, you know, in a better way. So just, but getting the exercise as to getting set, setting measurable goals is the, probably the way to go from the very beginning, because it, it sets you up for success and having a good practice, you know, like the foundation of a good practice. Um, one of the things that I kind of, if I were to really oversimplify <laughs> the types of campaigns that we run, uh, I would probably say that there are a few types. So the campaigns that we currently run, you know, we have the long tail. So these are long campaigns that can last years. And in this particular case, we have the COVID-19 data portal, which you know we launched in April 2020, and now it's like one over one year going strong, and we still are doing bits. So it's a very long campaign, you know, tons of data, lots, pretty tricky to to measure its impact. Um, and then you have the recurring campaigns, and these are easy because you kind of you have them already in your social media calendar. Um, you know, for example, we have Open Access Week, which is very important to us. We have the Women and Girls in Science. Um, we, you know, we have a couple of others that are recurrent. And those kind of, you already know what's coming up, you know, you, you know, you know when they're happening. So that really allows you for enough time for planning. And then we have the one-offs. And the one-offs sometimes, you know, like we've had the 12 genomes of Christmas, which is where it was like 12 videos from our directors and our collaborators uh, talking about uh, a selection of 12 genomes. And, you know, it was fun, for example, to, to do, but we didn't get the engagement that we were anticipating. So it did turn out to be just a one-off. Um, and then there's the type of um, campaigns that we try to run away from. <laughs> and that's the reactive ones, you know, when you suddenly see something and you feel the urge to do the same thing, or to do a campaign right then and there. Um, because most of the time that means you're skipping a lot of steps and you're skipping your check boxes. Um, um, and then the, qu the quality may be, or the re rationale behind it may be questionable. Um, the other thing would be the last minute one is the one that, oh, we forgot about, oh, I, I think this is important, we should do it. Or somebody comes through the door and like, we want this campaign now. Um, I would say that, you know, sometimes you can whip it up together if you have the resources, if you have the content, it's, you know, yeah, you'll be a little bit stressed out about it, but you can probably make it happen. But other times it's just unreasonable. And, you know, it's okay to say no to, to things like that. But what you can do, if it's a good idea, but you just simply don't have capacity or time to put it together, put it in the social media calendar for next time and set the expectation that you need more 
a bit more time to prepare for this. You know, I think one of the things that we have to do in our jobs, and it's a bit tricky, is that we have to manage expectations from the rest of the team, you know. Uh, comms is not something, comms, you know, if you want to do comms well, you, you can't do it quickly. You can do it with short notice. Comms requires a lot of planning, you know, if you want to be strategic and efficient, you really need a bit of a heads up. So a discouraging last minute request is the way to go because it will build better practice for the whole team going forward. Um, the other thing is the hashtags that, okay, so if you are on Twitter or other, you know, social media, you, you, you see that sometimes you get all these trending hashtags and there's a holiday for every day of the year, you know, whether it's metagenomics day or biodiversity day or a world cancer day or melanoma day, or, you know, obviously you could probably take part in something every single day but you, you probably don't have capacity for that. So it's really good to pick your battles and think what exactly aligns with your strategic objectives. What would be that one, two, three things that you'd like to do a year that you'd like to, you know, campaigns that you'd like to make meaningful and you'd like to make sure that they really align with what you're trying to achieve and really deliver that message uh, because there's just not enough time in the world to tackle all of the uh, days and holidays that are out there. So just pick your battles and pick them well. Um, the other thing is peer pressure. You know, sometimes you see partnering organizations doing things and you feel like you're missing out. And it's possible that sometimes you are. And if you are, then definitely take that day or that event and add it to your social media calendar for next year and get in touch with your partners ask them, are you planning on doing anything? Shall we do something together? But sometimes it may be that it might be the right decision for your partners or for your collaborators, but it might not be the best decision for you. So don't let this pressure that amounts just by seeing everyone else doing something tell you what you're supposed to put in your calendar. Um, definitely go back to the basics and try to figure out what are the, let's say, three, four things you want to do a year that are really, really good and are really well aligned with what your sort of purpose is as a comms you know, person in your team. Um, ooh, the box checking exercise, that's my favorite. Um, that's, you know, some, sometimes we have to manage uh, this very tricky balance because we have a lot of people to please. You know, we have funders, we have policymakers, we have, partners, collaborators, and sometimes, you know, there is this great idea to do a campaign because we know it will please somebody, but it doesn't necessarily align with what our audience wants, or it will very much look out of place. Uh, so we have to be very careful. Sometimes it's possible to combine the two, because obviously you want to say thank you to the people who are helping you out and collaborating and contributing. On the other hand, you don't want to alienate everyone else on your follower list, uh, just because you're trying to deliver this one message. So chances are, may, there may be a better channel to do that. Perhaps you want to use a newsletter, you know, a dedicated newsletter for a particular message instead of putting it all out on Twitter. So just be mindful of, you know, not rushing into campaigns that are not quite, don't quite fit the pattern. Um, the other thing I wanted to, talk about was the campaign essentials. So uh, there's a particular checklist you can go through. And you know, in our team, uh, and I'll show you a little bit of a screenshot later, we do have um, like a little comms plan template that we use to actually fill in all of the diary, all the information for a campaign. It really helps us keep track of everything. But if I were to put a, just a very short checklist, it would be you know, definitely a point to the campaign owner. Make sure that you know who's gonna sign off on it and make sure you know who's gonna own it. This doesn't necessarily need to be the same person, but knowing exactly who's behind it, who's the one person that will be aware of everything that's happening around the campaign is essential. Um, pinpoint your audience. And that means actually knowing and writing down, you know, who you're talking to. If, if somebody tells you we're talking to everyone, well, that's not exactly, that doesn't work. 
you know, you can be talking to everyone. You're definitely not talking to three-year-olds. You won't be talking to people who are outside of your field, for example. So you have to really try to put, you know, if it helps, three categories of people that you're talking to just to help you visualize, you know, what kind of language, what kind of tone, what kind of resources you're going to try and communicate further. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, setting measurable objectives is, is key as well. So actually asking yourself, what are the things that would make this campaign a success? What does success look like you know, for this particular campaign? You know, are we, would we be happy to get 200 visits to our you know, page, for example? Or would we be happy to get 50 signups for the webinar or stuff like that? So setting very specific measurable objectives it's very helpful to see where you stand and you know how close were you to achieving the goal. Um, messaging, the messaging again, messaging can be a single message for your campaign, but it could be dedicated messages for different various groups that you're talking to. You know, if you have like three sub um, segments of your audience and you may have a slightly different message for each, it's really good to jot it down so that you know what the specifics are. Um, and also to get a sign up for that. Um, identify channels, you know, that doesn't mean that if you have five channels, you use them all. It may be that for a particular campaign, you'll just focus on, you know, Twitter and Facebook, and for another one, you'll just be doing things on YouTube, or for another one, you're just gonna be streaming on Instagram. So it's really important just to find the right channel for the right campaign. Um, also, have a conversation and have some thought about the resources needed to put this together. It might be that you have a grand plan but you actually don't have resources to pull it off. So, you know, putting together a, a, an actual plan for, you know, what is required time-wise, um, you know, who, who's gonna need to participate and sign off on these things, especially many of you are collaborating a lot and they're using their networks to amplify the message. So, Putting all of that down is very important to make sure that you don't forget about all these other people that you're, that you're collaborating and uh, coordinating with. Um, the timeline is very precious. Most of the time, we probably really run out of time and we always on a deadline. But if you can actually plan in advance, especially with the recurring campaigns, that's a godsend <laughs> because then you can actually do things in a relaxed manner, you can really take your time, you can really perfect it, you can actually have time to be creative, which is probably the main thing, you know, around campaigns, you need time to be creative, to make it interesting and unique and engaging. Um, and um, again, evaluate your efforts. So at the end, you, you have to realize, you have to kind of, after the campaign is done, all said and done, you have to look at the numbers. You have to go through this exercise of evaluating what went well, what went wrong, what would be improved, lessons learned, and so on. Um, we like to have a campaign postmortem, as we like to call it. So after all is done, we do get together informally over coffee and cake, and we do have a sit down and talk about you know what went well, what we have learned from this, because it really makes the, the upcoming campaigns so much better. And you know sometimes you find things that you were very surprised about. We have these biases about how we think how we think things are going to go, how we think people are going to react to the content we put out there, and then we we get surprised. We look at the data, and you know our opinions are just slightly just up to the side so you have to stand by sometimes you know starting square one and that's fine but doing this exercise and especially the post mortem is something that a lot of people are skipping and you find that in time it really costs you time you know and resources so if you have the ability uh if you have somebody to exchange ideas with definitely do this uh post mortem exercise um and then uh, this is a template I just wanted to show you. So in our case, it's just kind of a Google Doc that, that we, we have and we just fill it in, we get it signed off. And that's where we add all the evaluation and all the postmortem, all the conclusions, and then we keep them stored and we revisit them when we're looking back at you know similar campaigns or we're looking to plan something similar. I think for 
each of you, this could be something different. This is a template that we kind of built together specifically for our team and our organization. We kind of kept adding some fields over time. Um, and I think it's, it looks quite different from what it looked maybe a year ago. So if you want to start something very small, just like a Google form or something like that, you can do that. Whatever it is, it has to work for you and for your team. So, but just having a bit of structure and knowing that, oh, we have a campaign coming up. Let me pull out that template and let me start filling it in. Let me see where the calls are. Let me see what more information I need. And that really kind of gives you a bit of a sense of control, you know, a sense of structure, and it just helps you kind of organize the work going forward. Um, one of the, I, I have about three examples here that I wanted to talk about, but before I, I go on, I just want to ask Aaron how much time I have left. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're coming to the end of the slot, but I think it would be really great to hear um, these examples. So, yeah, either All right. take one or go through them more quickly. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, so I wanted to give you an idea of uh, so the, the, long, the longest campaign we've been running right now for over a year is the COVID-19 data portal. We launched it in April. Um, you know, it's a continuous drumbeat. From the first launch, we had a big push and then we kind of have um, have been, you know, putting out a lot of news uh, about, you know, the new features, the new releases, new functionality, new partnerships, um, and it's a multi-channel approach. So we actually really had to go all in for this. Um, it's probably one of the most complex things we've had to do in the past years. And um, just to give an idea of, at the very launch, when we just just had a press release out. We got 99 clippings in 18 countries, including the news and tech crunch. Uh, the, the main tweet that went out got you know over 4,000 engagements. And then we have follow-up tweets from collaborators, including Ursula van der Leyen. Um, so it was a very successful um, launch. You know, the video itself got you know, 1,200 views initially, by the way, on YouTube, and then over 27,000 views on Twitter. Um, and there was a lot of deliverables. So basically one of the things that, you know, we had to do pre-launch was to pitch the idea of the COVID-19 data portal launch to a lot of the journalists and see who was interested to write about it. If it ended up that, you know, we had Euro News and TechCrunch writing about it. And then we had all the, all these things that we had to produce and put out after the actual launch. And that was the initial press release. We did an editorial feature on the importance of COVID-19 uh, data sharing in the climate of this pandemic and how it speeds up you know, research. Uh, we produced three videos, the one about the launch, one about the six month mark, and then we produced one about partners who have developed their own um, sort of nodes, uh, COVID-19 portals in their countries, uh, because this kind of grew you know, over the first six months and then now over a year, um, just to, you know, then we obviously had the steady drumbeat of social media updates on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, we had a dedicated COVID-19 response page, so a web page where we summarize all of this information. We had a demo that was part of a conference that we featured and advertised. We had a specific case study for funders, which looked at the economic impact of the portal. Uh, which was specifically pitched to funders, so this was not made public. And then we have uh, monthly releases happening um, where we basically on social we, we tell people what new features have been added and so on. And just to give you an idea, you know, I'm not going to go get into the numbers very specifically, but um, we ended up just in April when we looked, we ended up with 183,000 uh, users. So for us, this was definitely a success. Uh, not only that the portal grew in itself, but we actually had users and people who found it very valuable and had very good feedback about it. And um, a lot of the people did find out about it from social. Um, we had photographs again. Um, we did learn quite a few lessons though. We did learn <laughs> that, you know, when during a pandemic when you're recording people remotely, uh, it's more low cost, it's quicker, but the quality uh, of the video is not great. So you have to be quite creative how you edit those videos to make it more appealing because there was you know an overload of of zoom videos everywhere so our videographer was very creative and did a really good kind of uh, setup for that um, 
the videos were too long. I mean, we did try to keep it under the two minute mark, uh, but it was a little bit over, but it was still too long. So for example, these are the stats for Facebook and you can see the drop off. So we kind of learned a lesson on that and we tried to shorten the videos, the upcoming videos after that, which is very tricky, especially when you're trying to, come to talk about very complex matters. Um, Facebook is dead to us <laughs> because they've changed our algorithm and now everything that's organic just doesn't come through. And all of our posts and effort to promote us on Facebook just died. So we kind of shifted from Facebook to LinkedIn, which turned out to be the, like, the best thing now because we've been getting tons of traction on LinkedIn. I think it's becoming the next big thing and um, we're dedicating a lot more time to it. Um, coordinating with partners, is very, very important and making sure you have your allies across multiple organizations and you have a campaign of the size is crucial. So definitely nurturing those relationships, helping each other, scratching each other's back is very important to make sure things run smoothly. Um, usefulness is probably more important than the, the, you know, the politics behind it because uh, the launch of the portal was so complicated, so complex, so many organizations part of it. There's all these bits you wanna communicate about like who was involved, you know, all the, give all the credit, but ultimately you want people to use the portal. So, you know, I think we probably should have dedicated a bit more time to the features and the usefulness and the application. But at the same time, we did have the duty to thank everyone for the funding and all of this stuff. So it's quite a tricky balance to, to achieve. Um, so definitely going back to the main objective, increasing number of users is the thing that I would probably tell myself in the back, you know, back in the day, like just go back to the main objective. Just remember, this is the main thing about this campaign. Um, the other quick example I wanna give you is the Open Access Week. So this was one of the current campaigns. Uh, this takes place in October every year. It's definitely aligned with our strategic objectives. Um, we usually run it on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, the 2020 theme was open with purpose. And we kind of try to align it a little bit with the COVID-19 data portal because it's open data. And for that, we produced basically a couple of things. We did a feature on open data, why it's important to share data during the pandemic, which got us about 280 views. We got a feature article on AI, um, which we did really, really well. Um, and then we got a portal recap video, the six month mark video. Um, and then we did a, like a, a demo, which is part of this as well. And then we did a webinar which um, was attended by 86 attendees. And um, so these are the things that we've learned. Um, AI is hot, open data is not. So <laughs> open data is something that we keep talking about over and over again. So people don't always react to it as, as great as they do to artificial intelligence or machine learning. So definitely tapping into that more often is something that we're gonna try and do in the future. Um, we did get additional validation that LinkedIn is the next place to be. And then um, we learned that we need to advertise these webinars a bit earlier, even though the open access week takes place that whole week and we advertise the week before, we probably should give people a bit more notice. We also learned that there is a 50% drop off in the webinar registration. So we should set the limit a little bit higher if we want to have let's say 100 people. Uh, actually attending. And um, the demo was not exactly a success. We tried it out, it didn't quite work out. I'm not sure we're gonna do it next time, maybe for a different feature, or for a different you know, data resource that might work better, but we had to try it. Um, and then we did uh, come up with a branded hashtag, which was support away, which did great because it was adopted by a lot of other international organizations. So it ended up being a thing on its own. And we were very proud that we kind of started it. Um, so just the, the last bit that I did uh, last minute, I told Aaron, just this past Saturday, this is one of those uh, experimental campaigns. Uh, we did the Biodiversity Day. And you know, you could call it a campaign, it's more of a mini campaign really, um, because it was an opportunity to address this very small but very important audience, people who were focused on biodiversity research. And we wanted to add some spotlight to some of our resources that don't always get a light, you know, shine on them. 
And the other bit was, it was a low risk experiment. So we could actually see, you know, how much traction we would get. So we basically did a thread of seven tweets where we did a summary of all of the resources that, you know, tackle or resources and project that tackle, you know, biodiversity research and how they could be useful. And this is what we found. Uh, we found basically we had 74 retweets uh, within the last couple of days, 189 likes, but we had only 28 clicks, which is a bit of a shocker because, uh, you know, that tells me that it's a nice thing to have. It looks great. People shared it. They like the idea of it. But we're not quite sure how useful it was, because ultimately we would have liked people to click on the resource and to start using it. So that tells me that these resources were not new to our audience. They knew about them. So, you know, they kind of forwarded further down the road to see whether other people may find out, you know, about them. But they were not particularly useful to this particular group. So it's something that we're going to learn from and we'll have to get up with an idea how to tackle this in the future. So as I just want to say, I don't always have all the answers. This is some information we just got and we have to sleep on it.